We start with a point. Like the point we know from geometry, it has no size, no dimension. It's just an imaginary idea that indicates a position in a system. A second point, then, can be used to indicate a different position. But it, too, is of indeterminate size. To create the first dimension, all we need is a line joining any two points. A first dimensional object has length only, no width or depth. If we now take our first dimensional line and draw a second line crossing the first, we've entered the second dimension. The object we're representing now has a length and a width, but no depth. To help us with imagining the higher dimensions, we're going to represent our second dimensional object as being created using a second line, which branches off from the first. Now let's imagine a race of two-dimensional creatures called Flatlanders. What would it be like to be a Flatlander living in their two-dimensional world? A two-dimensional creature would have only length and width, as if they were the royalty on an impossibly flat playing card. Picture this. A Flatlander couldn't possibly have a digestive tract because the pipe from their mouth to their bottom would divide them into two pieces. And a Flatlander trying to view our three-dimensional world would only be able to perceive shapes in two-dimensional cross-sections. A balloon, for instance, would start as a tiny dot, become a hollow circle which inexplicably grows to a certain size, then shrinks back to a dot before popping out of existence. And we three-dimensional human beings would seem very strange indeed to a Flatlander. Imagining the third dimension is the easiest for us, because every moment of our lives, that's what we're in. A three-dimensional object has length, width, and height. But here's another way to describe the third dimension. If we imagine an ant walking across a newspaper which is lying on a table, we can pretend that the ant is a flatlander, walking along on a flat, two-dimensional newspaper world. If that paper is now folded in the middle, we create a way for our flatlander ant to magically disappear from one position in his two-dimensional world and be instantly transported to another. We can imagine that we did this by taking a two-dimensional object and folding it through the dimension above, which is our third dimension. Once again, it'll be more convenient for us as we imagine the higher dimensions if we can think of the third dimension in this way. The third dimension is what you fold through to jump from one point to another in the dimension below. Okay, the first three dimensions can be described with these words. Length, width, then depth. What word can we assign to the fourth dimension? One answer would be duration. If we think of ourselves as we were one minute ago, and then imagine ourselves as we are at this moment, the line we could draw from the one minute ago version to the right now version would be a line in the fourth dimension. If you were to see your body in the fourth dimension, You'd be like a long, undulating snake, with your embryonic self at one end and your deceased self at the other. But because we live from moment to moment in the third dimension, we're like our second-dimensional flatlanders. Just like that flatlander who could only see two-dimensional cross-sections of objects from the dimension above, we, as three-dimensional creatures, can only see three-dimensional cross-sections of our fourth-dimensional self. One of the most intriguing aspects of there being one dimension stacked on another is that down here in the dimensions below, we can be unaware of our motion in the dimensions above. Here's a simple example. If we make a Mobius strip, take a long strip of paper, add one twist to it and tape the ends together, and draw a line down the length of it, our line will eventually be on both sides of the paper before it meets back with itself. It appears, somewhat amazingly, that the strip has only one side, so it must be a representation of a two-dimensional object. And this means that a two-dimensional flatlander, traveling down the line we just drew, would end up back where they started without ever feeling like they had left the second dimension. In reality, they would be looping and twisting in the third dimension, even though to them it felt like they were traveling in a straight line. The fourth dimension, time, feels like a straight line to us moving from the past to the future. But that straight line in the fourth dimension is, like the Mobius strip, actually twisting and turning in the dimension above. So the long undulating snake that is us will feel like it is moving in a straight line in the fourth dimension, but there will actually be, in the fifth dimension, 
a multitude of paths that we could branch to at any given moment. Those branches will be influenced by our own choice, chance, and the actions of others. Quantum physics tells us that the subatomic particles that make up our world are collapsed from waves of probability simply by the act of observation. In the picture we are drawing for ourselves here, we can now start to see how each of us are collapsing the indeterminate wave of probable futures contained in the fifth dimension into the fourth dimensional line that we are experiencing as time.